hope you enjoyed your breakfast. And we're gonna get started, please. Whoa, we have a full room today. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Bill Gordon's session. He's going to be presenting on my favorite L words, living, laughing, loving, learning, and lifestyle. It's all about maintaining the balance. So please help me welcome Bill Gordon. Well, my plans have been foiled. I always make two copies of every handout, so I made 100, because I've attended before, and usually 50 is about a max, and so I thought 100 copies would be fine. Each of you would get two copies of everything. And, uh, and I do that because, as a teacher for 44 years, when I go to a workshop, I try to get double handouts, uh, either one for a colleague who couldn't come, or if it's something that's usable, I like to take one home to photocopy and steal, give to my students as a useful uh, tool and then work on one myself. And so when I do a workshop like this that has some activity that I would like you to do, I normally like to provide you with a second copy. So you will mess up the one I gave you, you'll write all over it, and still have one for using back at school. But all of us as speakers have been asked to uh, send our handouts to EverAct that they'll be on the website. And so if we do something this morning that you think you could make usable in your own junior or senior high school especially, then uh, it will be on, on the site. And none of them have any copyright, <clears throat> as if that would matter to you. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of white out and a Xerox, you pretty well got it covered, you know. <laughs> Print your own name on the bottom and it'll be good. This particular session actually uh, is not a brand new one for me. Uh, the first time I was asked to do a similar presentation was many years ago uh, at the Banff Conference for Guidance uh, Teachers, Guidance Counselors. And they had developed a program, I wasn't on the program, they had developed a program and they had come up with a great idea for a presentation but they had no speaker uh, for the presentation. So that happens, you say we really need somebody to talk about whatever it is, who do we know? And so somebody had come up with the idea that there ought to be a session for counselors called Laughing Your Way to Health and Prosperity. And so the event was being put on by the counselors in Elk Island Public Schools. They were the hosting counselor group, and I was one of those. And so they said, uh, you're fairly uh, strange, and perhaps you could go and do this session on la Laughing Your Way to Health and Prosperity. So I love a microphone, I love an audience. I'm, I'm by nature a shy person, except in these situations. Some of you might be the same way. If you're in drama and stuff like that, it's great. In a cocktail party, I'm a, kind of a shy guy, but I thought, hey, this would be all right. A good chance to speak to fellow counselors. I don't have a topic, but I could make one up and it'll be fine. I'll get the speech. And on, it went well. We told a few jokes, we had a few laughs. And on the drive back to Fort Saskatchewan, I thought, there's potential in this presentation, but it's too narrow for health and prosperity, wellness and well-being and, and a sense of balance in your life, laughter is, I, is really important. It got me in huge trouble when I was a student. <laughs> huge trouble. And I often heard the phrase, you think this is funny, Mr. Gordon? <laughs> yeah, get out. <clears throat> if my teachers could see me now, well actually they did see me because uh, many years after I left Lethbridge, where I grew up, they invited me back to be the closing keynote for the Southwest Teachers Convention. And so I was able to get up and say, see, I told you it was funny. You know, and my, some of my teachers were still in the audience. So I thought, this is excellent, this is great. But on the drive home, I thought, what else would go, would fit into this idea of balance? Not that I'm a balanced person myself. I'm like a lot of you, too much time at work, not enough time on other things, that sort of situation. But I felt there had to be a few things that I would add to that mix if I was going to maintain balance. And so I came up with the idea, all speakers do this, you've got to come up with a, with a trick to, in case all your notes blow off the podium, or if you're a tech person, and I'm not, you're, all of a sudden your laptop quits, you don't need the 27 more slides. You say, okay, I, I know what I'm going to talk about, because it's all going to start with L. So as long as I can think of five L words, I'm golden here. This is going to be, it's going to be great. So I sat down and thought, okay, laughter is going to be on my list always. But the other ones I put down were things like leisure, love, learning, and eventually, because I got so involved, uh, more and more involved with uh, Everactive School Work and uh, ASH, I added lifestyle, which referred to the physical health, physical activity, and healthy eating. Because I have no background in those areas in terms of training, 
we won't be talking about those two aspects, uh, a lifestyle aspect here today, except to mention that it's one of the five qualities. There are people here at the conference for whom the whole uh, healthy eating and active living is their whole reason for being at the conference. You've got, gone to some wonderful sessions, as have I, about these topics. So I'm going to focus on the other four, which come more into the realm of social emotional health, if that's all right with you. I've also used this uh, with COM classes as a guest speaker at COM. I haven't had my own classroom since uh, 1985 because I was a counselor, became a counselor at a big school of 1400 and part-time, worked four days a week, one day wandering. Uh, but I would go and into uh, other schools as a guest speaker or into COM classes in my own school, and I still do. I go back to the outreach school where I spent the last six years after retirement working as a part-time counselor uh, and help them teach their comm classes in an outreach setting, which is far different than in a classroom type setting. And I found that if I use only those five words, including lifestyle, I could do a whole curriculum. That everything that I would want to teach in comm could come out of, the, out of balance. So under lifestyle, I could teach the healthy eating, active living, or at least bring people in who could help me with that. And under the area of love, I could teach about relationships and communication, healthy, unhealthy relationships. Uh, all of that area could be taught under that. And in the area of learning, I would do all the career planning and goal setting and decision making under what we're learning about ourselves and where we're going in life. And under the leisure, I talk about personal passion and your things that you really want to accomplish in your life, the things that make you passionate about, whether it's caring for the earth or, or art or drama or music or welding or whatever it is, what, what are your passions. And under laughter, we do a lot on stress management and those kinds of things. So I thought I could build a whole curriculum around the five words. And we've tried that in outreach to say, well, let's see if we could do a series of, of seminars. We do seminars that students attend for credit, and we'll try to build around this, this balance. So I know that it works with high school students, and if you're working with high school kids, you might get a chance to try this down the road. So that's where we're coming from today, and so what I'm going to do is take you through some of the activities I would do with a, with a group of students even, to say, okay, let's find out a little bit more about your own personal balance and where, where you're going. And the first thing that I handed out to you was a, a sheet that uh, looks at things that you love to do. And this comes under the leisure or living category of the five L's. Now, there are other handouts that I have as well, which will be a little hectic once we get, once we get going. I love to set up a room before we start, but this is a breakfast room, so it wasn't quite what, what I'm used to. But uh, there will be a couple of points where we'll have to quickly hand out something to you that goes along with what we're, what we're talking about as well. When I used to work for the Family Life Ed Council as a volunteer, we talked about uh, ways that you could improve your life or feel better about yourself as a person. And one of the things that we talked about was to giving yourself a gift every day, gifting yourself on a regular basis. Because those of us in the caring professions very often spend a huge amount of time caring about other people and making sure they're okay. Are you okay? You're my student, uh, my, my family. But we forget about ourselves. We lay ourselves out of the mix. And so we wonder, why are we so exhausted? Why are we uh, not feeling as energized as we thought we would? Because at no time in that process did we put ourselves on the list, list of people that we ought to give a gift to. And so the first gift we're going to look at is the gift of leisure or living. And what you have in front of you is a chart that asks, if what are 10 things at the top half of the sheet, what are 10 things that you really enjoy doing. And they don't have to be gigantic. They don't have to be gigantic. Number one on my list, one or two on my list, is spending time with my grandchildren. Now, two of them live in Fargo, North Dakota, so that's not so easy. But one lives only 40 kilometers from me. She's the one who bought me this lovely tie. It's a nice got fish on it, it's beautiful. She bought me another one that has jelly belly on it, but I felt at a health conference that would be, <laughs> Inappropriate, a tie full of jelly bellies, you're just drooling the, like the whole time. And Riley, and Riley said, if you're going to be important, you should wear a tie. So I had a tie, so I put it on today, so that I would be important. And I promised my granddaughter, whenever I would do a presentation, I will wear one of the ties she buys me. So every time I, she goes someplace, I get a, who knows what tie I will get next. She's now, she's now 11, so maybe, coming up 12, so maybe the, the tie era will be over soon, I don't know. But I love what she buys, so hopefully you enjoy it from, from where you are. So one on my list, I might put number one on my list, time with my grandchildren, especially Lucy, who is very close physically uh, to us, only uh, 24 minutes away, by, and spends uh, uh, maybe a day every couple of weeks with us. Every time there's a school holiday in her school division, then she comes and spends the day with us and that kind of thing. So I love that, all right? So it's a very small little pleasure in my life, but it'd be on my top 10 things I love to do. Something maybe larger, 
working on your Harley Davidson that you bought for $35,000. You know, that may be, you know, a little bit bigger pleasure that you have. But take a moment, just for a second, to brainstorm your own brain and write down, just really quickly, some things you'd love to do. Just the top half, don't worry about the bottom. There's five at the bottom as well, don't worry about those. Just do the top ones, just a really quick, 10 things you love to do. And if you had more time in the day, uh, you would do that. All right. Now, <clears throat> even if you don't have all 10, that's fine. You get the idea, you've written down 10 things you love to do. These are things that really make you happy, give you great enjoyment in some way or another. At the bottom, you'll see that there are five, five more lines. And you see, they re refer to a wish list or a bucket list. These are things that one day you really hope to be able to do in your life. But each of those lines has a different uh, context. So the first one, which says WBL, this is your bucket list. What, there are two of the lines devoted to that. These are the big schemes you have. One day you're going to whitewater raft every major river in North America. One day you will skydive. You keep saying you're going to skydive, and one day you will. You're going to write that book, and it's not because it's your thesis. It's because you want to write this book and you've had it in you for a long time and you're going to, even if you self-publish or online produce it, you're going to. So the, the two lines that say WBL1 and 2, what are two really great dreams you have that one day this is going to happen, you're going to do this, all right? The WLG, there's two of those, and those ones are both uh, learning things, something you'd love to learn. Spanish, to play the guitar, salsa dancing, welding, something you, and not again because it will help your career to reach a high potential, but you've always wanted to learn this. I met a fellow who owns a bed and breakfast in uh, Kimberley, BC, and uh, in mid-50s when I met him, he had this bed and breakfast. I'd gone there to present and I stayed, to, people put me up in this bed and breakfast, and there's art all over the wall. And I said, wow, you have a very wide collection of art in different styles. And he said, yes, they're all mine. I've done them all. They're all, that's me. I've painted all of these. And I said, well, that's amazing. And he said, yeah, what's more amazing, he says, I was an engineer for Shell Oil, chemical engineer, because my parents wouldn't let me go to university and take what I wanted, which was art. They wouldn't pay for it. So he said, I went to the University of Calgary. And it was in the old days when you had to stand in line with a little punch card and register for things in person. That was your line. You were in line registering, not online. You're, you're in line. And, you, and so he was standing in this line to become a dentist. He thought, I'll be going to dentistry. That's what I'll do. My parents will pay for that. He was standing in line to become a dentist, and the line wasn't moving. It just stayed stationary. And he looked over, and the line next to him was moving. And he said, what are you guys signing up for? He said, engineering's good. And he went, and he became an engineer. This was his career plan. <laughs> and he became a very successful engineer for Shell Oil, worked in, the, in Indonesia with the oil rigs. So he did a great thing that he got downsized in his 40s. And he finally went to the Alberta College of Art and Design, which he had always wanted to do from age 17. He was the oldest student in his graduating class. He got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree by the time he turned 50. And then he painted what he, all his life. The engineering paid for him to have the bed and breakfast, and, but he had this dream. What he wanted to learn, he finally got a chance to do. So the learning is the thing that you always wanted to do. Maybe you didn't because it wasn't practical, or now you've decided you're going to travel the world, you need to speak seven languages, you're going to learn languages. But what would be your learning wish? Okay, that would be that, that one uh, for that area. And the, the last one, which is the WLS, is like, almost like a free space. Anything else that you can think of that's in your, in your kind of a, your wish list of things to do. You may not have all five. Maybe you've got one. That's fine. Take a moment to think, what do you have? What are your big dreams and wishes for yourself? The way that I use this, this chart in class with my students or with any group is to say, okay, now you've looked at maybe 10 things that may bring great joy and pleasure to your life. They're under the leisure L. Choose one, just choose any one of them. It, maybe the first one you wrote down is the one that immediately came to your mind. It's highest on your list, so you said that's number one for me. But maybe not. Maybe partway down you realize, oh, you know what I forgot? This is the one I like the most. But choose one of the ten, just any one you want. And I'd like you to do the following. Using the chart on the right, you're going to indicate some things about that one you've chosen. So this is just the top half, the ordinary things in life that you enjoy. So the first column that you see is a dollar sign. And you know when you go... Uh, to some place to stay, like the Delta here, and you, uh, you look it up in a travel book, and it tells you how expensive it's going to be to eat at the Fireweed Grill. 
<laughs> really expensive. Okay, so, <laughs> so the number of dollar signs tells you how expensive is it going to be. So look at the thing you've listed that you're thinking about. How many dollar signs do you have to spend to enjoy that activity? It could be from zero to five. How expensive is that on your, on your list of things that you love? When Lucy was a little girl, a little granddaughter, it cost me nothing. Now that she's 11 going on 28, and we go to the mall, it costs me significantly more. Do you think this looks nice? Yes, of course, I'm your grandfather, certainly it does. You know, so it costs me more now, but it's a really inexpensive. I don't have many dollar signs for time with my grandkids. It's not an expensive thing. The R stands for relationship. Does this activity enhance or improve a relationship? By doing that, do you and another person improve your relationship as a time with a friend? If so, check it off. Yes, this is a relationship activity I really enjoy. The L, does it generate laughter? Is this a laughter producing thing? When you're participating, you get a lot of laughter out of this, you get a really good time, you get a lot of chuckles, guffaws, belly laughs, it's a, just a really a fun thing. You can sort of see where I'm going with the time with grandchildren. So far, I'm, I'm three for three, <laughs> right? Three for three on this one. PH is physical health. Is this an activity, perhaps you put down uh, going for a run in the evening with your partner? And so for you, it so far has accomplished all four for four because it's good for your physical health. Time with my grandchildren is good for my physical health. I had a heart attack in 2004 and in West Edmonton Mall. It's really a pleasure to have a heart attack in West Edmonton Mall. But I drove myself home. That's what men do. <laughs> I, eating roll aids all the way. I'm sure it's just heartburn. Yeah. Then they took me back in an ambulance to Edmonton. You should have stopped. You, pa you passed two hospitals on the way. <laughs> Back to Fort Saskatchewan, you usually just stopped at the Royal Alec, you know, that's where we're taking you. So I have to watch my blood pressure, and an afternoon with any of my grandkids, if I take my blood pressure before I start, and after, it drops. My blood pressure is way down. It's just so, so much physical activity, so much fun, so much relaxation, it drops. Five, ten points it could drop, just in the afternoon with, with the grandkids. So physical health. ED does not stand for erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Does this activity give you erectile dysfunction? Well, yeah. I hate this activity. I don't know why I listed it. Why am I joking? I'm 67. Jeez. Educational. <laughs> Do you, is it a learning experience? Do you learn anything while you're participating in this activity? You won't be able to teach it in class now without chuckling when you start to talk to kids. Well, this is, okay. First time I did this for a big group, 160 social workers and caregivers in Grand Prairie. And they'd come together because as caregivers, they give a lot, like you do, to a lot to other people. And they're looking for parents who have Alzheimer's and things like that. And they were just exhausted a lot, you know, foster parenting. And so they'd come together for a relaxing day. And I was to do a half day. This was intended as a half day session you and I are in for an hour. and. Uh, it was interesting because right in the middle of the room, there was a table, all female, all from Manning, Alberta. So I don't know if any of you hear from Manning, Alberta, but we think Edmonton is north when we live in Edmonton. No, Manning is north. And they had come together, came by, uh, traveled in a van together, they'd been at this workshop, and they're in the middle of the room, and they're having too much fun with this activity. They are laughing and cheering, patting each other on the back. Like, what? It's not that good an activity. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right, but it's not that great. So I had stopped, you know, like, there's something funny over there, <laughs> table 72, you know. They said, yeah, yeah, look what Juliet wrote down for her favorite thing, sex. <laughs> Having sex with her partner. Does it cost a lot? Is it a relationship? Do you get some laughter out of it? Well, <laughs> yeah, it depends, you know. <laughs> Is there some physical health? Is it educational? At times, you know. Uh, <laughs> So no wonder they're having such a good time. I can imagine the van ride back to Manning, you know, like it, phew. Did they share it when they got home? I'm, I doubt it, you know. And the S stands for spiritual. Is this a spiritual thing for you? And I don't mean religious necessarily. I just mean it's good for the spirit, good for the soul, whatever that means for you personally. Is it one of those kind of activities that, that really is uplifting for you? 
so when I look at my, the two that I have on my list usually, well I've done this so many times, they're always on my list now, time with my, with my partner in life, uh, Jean, we've been together since we were in junior high school. And, uh, well, not two weeks in high school we weren't together, it was apparently my fault, but it was, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> it's pretty sure. I phoned her every day to say, look, I'm sorry about high school. You know, I did phone her. It's almost time to call now, actually. So, but aside from that, we've been together a long time. And so time with her and time with my grandkids are high on my list. So for me, when I go across a list like this, I know why they're important to me, because they check all the boxes. They really do. And if they don't, they check, say, five out of six. They're really excellent for life balance. They, they check so many things. The one through ten on the far side is later, if you were rank ordering these, if you had one hour in your day that you could devote to one of these activities only, which one would you choose? Which would be your number one choice? There are no bad ones on that list, so it's a tough decision. And maybe you say, well, next ten weeks I'll choose one a week, you know, whatever. Or maybe I'll get all ten done this week. But what would be your number one choice, the thing you most would not want to eliminate from the things that you like to do. And I used to have another column that had a question mark which meant when's the last time you actually did that? And if you said, I don't know, I don't think there was snow on the ground, oh, then you're really letting yourself down. If that's on your top 10 and you can't remember the last time you actually called up your best friend and you just went for an evening out together and you can't remember, the last time you dated your partner, you can't remember when that was, what are you doing? That's crazy. It's on your top 10 list of things you love to do, and you've neglected it. You've neglected yourself in that process, right? And the students I've done it with, we don't do it at the very first thing we've ever done because we don't know them, they don't, us, don't know us. They're like, well, I love, to do, I love to do drugs, man. You know? So we, we like to be a little further into the process of getting to know them and building trust before we lay them. What's your top 10 things you like to do in life? I like to break into houses. You know? <laughs> we, don't, uh, we try to discourage uh, that kind of thinking. On the bottom are your, is your big wish list. These are the dreams you have for yourself. One day, man, one day. And one of my favorites ever was a, that same group of social workers and caregivers in Grand Prairie who was in her mid-50s and a very petite woman. Like, if she was here at the lectern, <laughs> hello, I'm here to speak to you today. And the, so that's what you would see of her, you know? She's a very small person. And her wish list was to buy a Harley and travel across Canada on the Trans-Canada Highway on her Harley Davidson. And the people started to laugh at her. They did. And she looked she was very offended by this. Well, you don't think I can drive a Harley? It'll kill you. You'll, you'll stop, it'll fall over, you'll be dead. You're gonna buy a trike. Buy a trike, it's got the two wheels in the back, one in the front. And I, every time I go on Highway 2, I'm just hoping that a 55-year-old social worker, four foot nothing, on her Harley will go by and give me the finger. They keep, they keep going. You know. That's it. There she is. I met her in Grand Prairie and she's on her way to Ontario. You know, that was her wish. And I don't doubt that she's going to do that. I mean, she's saving up for the Harley. She's got a plan. You know, and I think she'll do it. You have a big wish, a big dream in any of those five? How many did? You have a big dream or goal for yourself. Anybody brave enough to tell the room what it is? We won't laugh. This is a much more caring group than all those social workers. <laughs> Anybody wish to share their big dream, their big goal, their big wish? Yes, way over there. Yes, ma'am. Um, I always promised myself that I would like to take him to Paris. Okay. Got the plans in the works? Been looking it up and doing the trip, booking the hotels? Or? He is. <laughs> <laughs> he took us to Vegas to see the other rights hotel. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we will laugh at you. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's great. Did you tell him it was Paris? Did you say we're going to blindfold you? <laughs> pay a bunch of people to pretend to speak French? <laughs> a little beret? <laughs> Excellent. What's your name? Jennifer. Jennifer. Where are you from, Jennifer? Uh, Edson. Edson. I have a gift for you because you were brave enough to speak up. I have this book for you. It's called The Wish List. 10,000 things that you, could, you, that you could do. Oh, enjoy the nude beach at Club Med in Guadalupe. <laughs> I'll check that off for you here. <laughs> I'm not kidding, that's what, I just opened to a random page. <laughs> so at some point, you'll have to come up now, it's a long walk up here, but this is for you, okay? And also, what I always carry with me, this pencil. It says on it, you are awesome. So, thanks for doing that, I appreciate it.
I buy these pencils by the 500 uh, in Calgary, at a little place by uh, the mall down on Cloud Trail, I forget what it's called, down that end of town. The lady brings them in from Montreal. They say, you are awesome. And I carry them with me everywhere. So if I see somebody, like the people who clean my room, they're hoping for a tip, but I gave them a pencil. And, uh, <laughs> so you, that was awesome. Because of the big group, we can't do a lot, a huge amount of sharing, but is there anybody else who would love to tell this group what their big plan is? I have no more books, by the way. So you, <laughs> just so you know, I don't bribe you. Yes. <laughs> oh, nice. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else? Yes. Mine's a large, but I'm starting. I would like to hike every trail in the national parks in Canada. Wow. All right. I might need to like that. Excellent. Have you hiked any? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know if your goal is already in process. Yeah. Jasper. So we got somebody going to Vegas for Paris. Do you get any chance to sail at all now? Uh, I go home and I like to sail. Okay. Where's home? Oh, okay. Excellent. There's somebody over here from Truro. You want to have a chat? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. The neat thing about these dreams, when we talk to kids about them, especially in class, their wish lists are really interesting. I find them very, very interesting. And some of the some of the least expected answers come from kids that you would never think that that's what they would, that that would, would be something they would want to do. Sometimes they're very adventurous. Sometimes they're as simple as one day I'll pass math. You know, like uh, thinking of uh, Alexander if you went to her session yesterday. One day I'll pass math, a big wish list, a big dream of my life, you know, I'll, I'll get through a math class. As a counselor, the number of times I heard kids say, I'll need math in the first semester. Why? Because I'll be failing it. And I'll, <laughs> I'll need to take it again in the next semester. Yikes, talk about self-fulfilling prophecy, right? But one of the great things, and I do this with students especially, is to focus first of all on the things you love to do and how often do you give yourself the opportunity to enjoy any of these things on your top 10 list. And if you haven't, to actually schedule it. If you're with a partner in life and you haven't dated in a long time, schedule a date. Man, oh man, you know, you've got to be doing that, right? Gene and I, and the people in our neighborhood, when we moved to Fort Saskatchewan, it was our first home, our first job, and everybody had one little kid and another little kid on the way, and the trees were all this tall, and there was no grass. It was, you know, one of those new subdivision kind of things in Fort Saskatchewan. And we are all a long way from home. We are from Lethbridge. Our neighbors were from uh, some, you know, Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. We had no family. And so the five people around us all became a family to each other. And we made this kind of a commitment that two weekends a year, a couple could go away for the weekend, and another couple in the neighborhood would care for the children. You can't call up grandma and, and aunt, so they're not there. So we would give our children to the next door neighbor, we'd go away for the weekend. And we always took the first weekend, Gene and I took the first weekend in March and the first weekend in December were our weekends away. And we'd go all the way to Edmonton. And uh, <laughs> you could stay at the West Inn for $40. <laughs> See how old we are? And because it was half price, they were half price because nobody, business people weren't traveling, so they dropped two for one meals, man, and we had a single income, so this was like major, this was great. Another couple went camping, that was their weekend away. Our parents thought this was terrible. We never left you at home, we took you everywhere. And we said, yeah, we hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us the hell at home. <laughs> Jeez, we don't want to go see Aunt Margaret. <laughs> one more time. Just go see Aunt Margaret by yourself for pizza. <laughs> you know? So, but we thought it was great. Two weekends a year were our weekends away. And long after the boys, we have two sons, long after the boys moved out the first time and then the second time. <laughs> the third time. <laughs> long after the boys moved out, we still take our weekends. And people say, that's crazy. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have any kids at home. I said, yeah, and the point is what? And so we, we, sometimes we'll go to Victoria now. We can go further, you know. Kananaskas, you know, if it was the right weekend, you'd be here. You know? But it was one of these cases where we just decided, the, the whole neighborhood just decided you needed that. Young parents, young kids working on the job. It'd be great to be able to get away for a weekend together. And so that's the deal we made with each other. And uh, three of the families still live in the neighborhood. Our kids are growing up and have kids of their own, but we still, uh, two of the three of us still take weekends and we 
try to make sure it's a, like the anniversary weekend that this is the one we always go away. There was a point it became Christmas shopping in December. It kind of lost its mystique, but you know, it was still our weekend away, right? So these are the kind of things that we owe ourselves. We really do. And if we have to shift something else around, we should, because why, what, what would we move? Well, I could spend more time marking papers. That would be good. Eh, they could wait. You know, the kids hadn't been late. They can wait another couple of days. You know, go away. Do that kind of thing. With a wish list, I love doing that with, with kids because once they have their wish list, then we get the whole thing about goal setting and decision making. Right? So one day you want to see Paris. That is amazing. What have you done so far? And the kids look like you're crazy. I'm, I'm 16. I said, well, have you looked up uh, what you do there? Have you kind of checked out? Have you bought a travel book on Paris yet? Have you looked it up, you know, to see what it's like? Do you own all the books and all the trails and national parks around Canada? Did you buy all their trail books? I've got the ones for Alberta, but I don't have ones for hiking in BC, for example. But I could get those, and I could start building my dream out and say, oh, there's my first one in BC I'm going to do, right? So you begin to think, what can I do now to make this dream become a reality down the road? And one of my favorite students of all time was a young woman that, I, that we, only, we had in our school in grade 10 and 12. In grade 11, she went to St. FX to, to, to the hockey school there. Uh, she was a goalie and played women's hockey. <clears throat> and so she went there for a year, but wanted to graduate with her friends back in Sherwood Park. So she came back for grade 12, an outstanding student, a great athlete. And her goal, she came to me one day as a counselor, and she said, I, I have, you know, we're talking about dreams, she said, my dream is to become an Egyptologist. And I, I'm sure I had the deer in the headlight look like, uh, what? Yeah, Egyptologist, what is that? She said, this is a person who's an expert on ancient Egypt, all things Egyptian. I'd like to get a degree in Egyptology. I said, do they have a degree in Egyptology? She said, well, you're the counselor. You tell me, do they have a <laughs> degree in Egyptology? I'm coming to you. You got the box here for being the counselor. Where would I go to get a degree in Egyptology? And I thought, Cairo? I don't know. Maybe Cairo would be good. So we looked it up. And there's one university in all of North America, you can get a graduate degree in Egyptology. Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island, is one of the Ivy League schools. 25,000 a year tuition, you must live on campus the first year at another 15,000. Travel back and forth to Edmonton, I'm sure your parents would be really happy I brought you this attention that you can go <laughs> to Brown University. Go home and tell your mom and dad, Mr. Gordon says I should go to Brown University. <laughs> at 60,000 a year, that would be American. That would be, you know, really exciting. But I said, the news is you can't go for an undergraduate degree there in Egyptology. It's a graduate degree only. You can get your Bachelor of Science or BA, whatever you want, elsewhere. Someplace where they play hockey, for example. And so, uh, but she looked it up. They had a women's hockey team in Brown, so she was even more excited. <clears throat> now, what she did, she said, well, I've never been there. I've never even been to the U.S. And I said, well, uh, good news, our younger son is teaching psychology at Brown University at the moment, just on a three years uh, job there. And so he's there, I visited the university, and they have at the front of this university, which is so old that they house revolutionary American soldiers in the barracks, in the dorms, that's how old it is. They got these big stone pillars out front that used to be a big gate, and they rebuilt the gate. And when a person uh, graduates from Brown University, all the graduates in their gowns stand inside the gates, and they open them out into the world, and they walk out, graduates of Brown University, out into the world, go out and make a difference. And they have a big poster that highlights these big stone pillars. <clears throat> so I wrote my, I phoned my son in, in Providence. I said, can you do me a favor, go to the bookstore and buy one of those posters and send it to me. And when I got there, I gave it to the, the young woman who is my client, and I gave her the poster and I said, you need to put this someplace where you can see it every day and that becomes your vision. This is where you want, you want to be going through the gates of Brown at some point in your, in your life. And what she did was really smart. She put it on the ceiling of her bedroom. <clears throat> so first thing she saw every morning when she got up and the last thing before she saw the light were the gates of Brown. Now I wish this was a chicken soup for the soul story. Where said, and she went to Brown and became a successful Egyptologist. I don't know. I've tried to find her on Google and search and all those, uh, Facebook, but I, I can't. She graduated honors out of the University of Saskatchewan. She played ho hockey for the for women's hockey team there. She was an honor student, so if anybody was going to get a scholarship to Brown, she'd be the one. But I don't know if she ever did. Whether she did or not would be really irrelevant to me because what she was a goal setter, she's a person who would see a wish list and say, that's all right. I'm envisioning this. I can see where I'm going. I'm making plans. She wrote, wrote to, to the university to get all of the books about how you register and everything about Rhode Island and that kind of thing. And I was really a, 
really pleased with how she proceeded through it. And I would love to find her. I think one day <clears throat> she may write back on Facebook. That's what I'm hoping. But a, lot of, a lot of you get uh, Facebook stuff from students? Yeah. I find it's really, really interesting to hear where they are now. They try to, are you the guy who taught me whatever? Yeah, I'm in Texas now. That's what I do. And I'm hoping she'll be one of those kids down the road that writes back. So when you look at your own visioning, when you say, look at your wish list, what is it that uh, you're doing already toward achieving one of those goals? Have you done anything yet on the list? Thank you. When I did a few years ago, I decided I'd like to play the piano. I took it till I was 13 and I refused to go anymore <clears throat> because I was 13. But when I got uh, older, I wished I hadn't quit. And so I thought, well, and I'm always telling other people, if you got a wish, you should go for it. So my first goal was to phone around Fort Saskatchewan and see if anybody teaches adults how to play the piano. And there was a guy who did. So I thought, okay, that, that's the first step of my goal accomplished. Week number two, go and actually see the person. And he gave me some music books, like the beginner ones, scales and stuff. And I thought, I'll go for a lesson. And that was the most embarrassing thing I've ever done. I took piano like for seven years, I should know something. No. And I sat there in the waiting room, and there's all these little kids <laughs> whose feet didn't touch the floor. They're sitting in, they're sitting in the chairs. And I look over, they got the same books that I've got. <laughs> and there's a little girl sitting next to me and her legs are swinging. And he, she looked at me and said, do you have a kid taking piano? <laughs> I said, no, I'm taking piano. And kids are so, oh, they love me. You're really old. <laughs> You're really old. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, you're really old to take piano. I went in, I could hear her playing, and then there's me. I didn't do a recital, I'm telling you that. And I never bought a piano. I'd go to school really early in the morning before the band kids would show up and go in the music room, do my practicing before they showed up. And then eventually my family bought me a keyboard with headphones. <laughs> this is really important. So I sort of achieved it. But the first thing in terms of, of of the balance is to look at that list occasionally and remind yourself, these are things I like. Can I say I've done any of them lately? Step one in the whole process. The second L is learning. One of my, <clears throat> we, I talked to a person here about the reading to students, like taking some time just to let them sit and listen and just read. Even if you're teaching math, you've got 15 minutes left over and I'd like to read you an excerpt from a favorite story. And we forget that even high school kids like to do that. They don't, they don't mind that at all. Many would really find it quite relaxing. And when I was taught junior high school, I taught junior high for 18 years in social studies and family life and health. And at the end of a, at the end of a week, I would choose a book and I would read an excerpt from it. And I especially liked the books by Leo Viscalia, who wrote books like Love and Love as a Behavior Modifier. He taught Love 101 at Berkeley University. Of course he did in the 60s. <clears throat> and he wrote this book called uh, Love. And there's a section in it that I really enjoyed, and I read it to my students. And in the story, he talks about being the 10th child in a family of 13, an immigrant Italian family. And they came from Italy. They had uh, just enough money to get the family there. They lived in one of the Italian neighborhoods of New York. They got furniture from relatives and neighbors and, you know, just getting started in America. Parents had no education beyond grade four in Italy, spoke no English. But they believed in education, and the, as soon as they got a little bit of money, they, the dad bought a set of Encyclopedia Britannica. A salesman came to the door, convinced him he needed a set of Encyclopedia Britannica. So his dad bought the set of Encyclopedia Britannica. They didn't have enough other things, but they had this set of books. And the father also had a rule, said Leo, when he was growing up, that nobody could leave the kitchen table until they told mom and dad one thing new they had learned at school that day. And once all 13 children had shared one thing they knew, then people could leave the table. And so every night, the kids would come home from school, and they'd be <laughs> washing up, and they'd say, what are you going to tell Dad? What are you going to tell Dad? He's going to ask you. He said, I don't know. I didn't learn anything today. I can't remember. I can't. So they'd run to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and they'd open it to something. Oh, the population of Canada is oh, 7 million in those days or whatever. Oh, 7 million. OK. Because the good news was Dad never, Dad never asked a follow-up question. Tell them one thing, move on. You've got 13 kids to get through. You don't have time for a whole discussion of this. Just get your 13 new pieces of information per day to live in America. That's the deal. 
And so they'd go to the table and they'd start with the oldest to the youngest. Do, 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 do. Leo was number 10. So Leo, what'd you learn new today? Well, Papa, I learned the population of Canada is 7 million. And the father would do the same thing with every single question. Mama, you hear this? Rosa, listen. Leo just told me, population of Canada, seven million. The mother, oh, what a lot of people. Way more than that in New York already. Oh, that's a lot of people. Luckily, they didn't say, where is Canada? What do you know about Canada? <laughs> the population. Every night of their lives, every night. Leo says when he got older and he's in his 60s, and he was traveling all over the world talking about his books, doing author tours and so on, he'd find himself in a strange city. And he'd go to the hotel room and he'd lie down to go to sleep. And before he could fall asleep, he'd hear this voice. Leo, what'd you learn new today? And if he couldn't answer his dead father's voice, he'd have to get up. He couldn't sleep. He'd look through the, oh, look at this. There's a, uh, there's a Denny's on the corner of a... Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. You know, I, boy, that's... Pop, I learned there's a Denny's at the corner of a, You know? And then he could sleep. And he said his parents infected him with this desire to always learn, your whole life, always be learning something. Challenge your brains, keep back, fight, fight back the Alzheimer's, get, get your brain going. And I, used, I, would re, I read that uh, little segment to students one, one year in grade nine, and many years later when I'd gone to Bev Facey to become a counselor, a local uh, drug rep from Shoppers Drug Mart was in Sherwood Park, heard that I was uh, at Bev Facey as a counselor, and she's a student of mine from Edith Rogers Junior High School in Millwoods in Edmonton. And she said, is, is Mr. Gordon a uh, counselor here? And they said, yes. Yeah. So they said, there's a uh, former student here to see you. She came down, and we had a really great visit. And she shared with me that when she went to Red Deer College, she bought the whole set of Leo Biscali books. And if she had a, da a roommate or a person who was feeling really down, she'd say, look, I'd like to lend you a book my teacher uh, read to me when I was in junior high school. And she'd lend these books out. She had her own little lending library of positive affirmation books that she would lend out her, her uh, fellow students at Red Deer College. And that's why we go into education, when that kind of story comes back to us, say, wow, that, well, something we did actually uh, touched somebody. And she also said that the thing that she had learned is never to quit learning. The one story, that's why you choose that story, because that's the one that I know affected one student really specifically, that always keep learning. And when I shared that story in Medicine Hat a few years ago at a, at a uh, volunteer conference, there was a whole group of people, uh, ladies in their 50s or older all had big red hats on. You ever meet that group, the red hat ladies? And after I finished my talk on the power of kindness, and I told this story about being kind to yourself to learn every day, and this lady came up and she was standing behind me and I was on a podium like this talking to somebody else and I felt this person pulling on my jacket. And I turned around and there was a person really small and really, really old. Like I'm old, but she's really old. <laughs> She'd be like my grandma. And uh, she said, young man, young man. Oh, yes, that's me. Yes. <laughs> I, loved your, I loved your talk. It was just really wonderful. I especially love the story about the learning every day. I said, well, thank you. It's one of my favorites, too. So said, I'm 94, and I live in the home just down the road. I don't have to live in the home. My brain's still good. But it's easier on my kids. I'm living in the home down the road here, and I'm with the red hat ladies. They said, yes. She said, I'll tell you about my growing up in Fort McLeod, Alberta. I thought, uh-oh, i got to catch a plane. <laughs> She's going to tell me about her childhood and she's 94. <laughs> My dad was an accountant. We had, I had four sisters or five girls and we had the same thing in our house except in our house we had to learn a new word every day and every day we'd have to tell our dad this word we learned but we couldn't just tell our dad the word. We'd have a conversation around the dinner table. Remember those? And you have a conversation around the dinner table and then the conversation we'd have to sneak our word in. We'd have to sneak the word in. And once we used the word we'd say, I use my word. And once all five of us girls had used our word, then we could leave the table. We thought our dad was crazy too, just like that Leo guy. <laughs> she said, you know, though, but I still like to learn a new word every day. I said, well, good. She said, you know that Reader's Digest? They got that word thing in there? I do it every time it comes out. I wrote that Reader's Digest. I said, you need harder words and bigger print. Harder words, bigger print. I said, good for you. <laughs> she says, I'm also the best. <laughs> she said, I also love to play Scrabble. I said, oh, do you? Said, oh, yes, keeps your brain sharp playing Scrabble. I said, good for you. She said, as a matter of fact, I'm the best kick-ass Scrabble player in the hole. <laughs> well, I looked down, there's a little 94-year-old lady. She's the kick-ass Scrabble player. Oh, good. good for you. 
Could be everybody else in the home has Alzheimer's, has no words left. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But she's the best. She could beat anybody at Scrabble. Even visitors. She even beats visitors at Scrabble. Well, I'm flying back from Messinghattan. If you're in Messinghattan, you're a long wait between planes. <laughs> I'm waiting in the airport, and I'm thinking about this lady. I think, man, I'd like to see her in action. I'd like to see her. I'm kind of picturing her in my mind. This is my vision of this lady. She's sitting in the lobby of the nursing home with a Scrabble board in front of her. All right? And people's kids come to visit their grandma or their moms in the home. And they go to visit. And there's this little old lady, so frail and gentle, sitting in front of this empty Scrabble board, looking all sad. Excuse me? Would you like to play some Scrabble? Well, what are you going to do? Turn her down? No. Oh, Oh, certainly. So you go and you sit down opposite her and you play the word the. <laughs> the. And then she smiles and she puts an N on the end. Then. Ooh, he said, oh. And then she, a few more little words. And then I picture her saying, would you like to play for money? And then the then becomes verisimilitude, triple word score, you know. <laughs> Xylophone on the, X is on the triple letter. Mm. And you go home broke, and she's paying for her whole nursing home bill on her hustling Scrabble players. I doubt any of that's true, but in my mind, that's how my mind works, very strangely. When people said you ought to go into counseling, I thought they meant as a career, and uh, it turned out they meant just get help. <laughs> So the second, in terms of learning, is to learn something new every day. I have no big activity on it except for the one you already did. You put down something you'd love to learn someday. How many put down something completely unrelated to what you actually do in life? Completely unrelated. See, that's the balance in it. We all learn stuff about our job. We uh, got to keep up in the latest stuff about uh, social emotional health and comprehensive school health. I got to learn what's going on. I got to know that because people expect that. But it's the things we'd love to do. Those of you who are, uh, all of you are educators, but those of you who are classroom educators are probably like a lot of people I know who hear of a really great book to read and they buy it, but they don't read it. They save it. They're their summer reading time. Because you couldn't possibly read in the winter, you know. <laughs> got to wait till the summer and you get the stack of e-books or actual books and you're going to read them when you have time. Instead of saying, hey, I owe myself a chance to read something I want to read. I can read this stuff later about the conference, but I, this is a book I really love. I'm going to read it now. Oprah told me it'd be good, so I, I ought to read it, right? So again, that's something that we add to our life. Are you going to pursue this goal to learn something you've always wanted to learn? It keeps your brain sharp, keep you happier in life. You're doing something for yourself. Whether it's going back to school or learning salsa dancing, it doesn't matter. As long as you're doing, being a kick-ass at something, that would be the goal. Number three on the list is the gift of love or the gift of friendship. And one of my, this is maybe my favorite, of, uh, even more than laughter, I think. The gift of love or friendship, time with somebody that you really care about and who really cares about you. When you look at your top ten list, how many of you had, say, maybe half of them had time with another person? Half of your top ten list were with people. See, that is your gift of, of love. Things that you're doing with people that care about you and you care about them. They respect you, you respect them. What a great gift that is, two-way, to yourself and to the other person. I have an assignment for you, and there would be a handout with this, but we really don't need the handout. We can, we can do this without, because sometimes I don't have the handout. I have a copy of it here, and if you want the actual physical thing, it's just a box with, with a bunch, about 15 circles inside, and each of the circles is cut in half. But this is the assignment I have for you, to try one of these L's out right away. Make a list, and you don't have to make the list now, but you know, as you're thinking about this as a homework assignment, make a list of all the people in your life that you love, admire, respect, or appreciate. Just make, make a list of their names. And it could be family, friends, coworkers, students, teammates, uh, members of your own team if you're a coach. But who are these people in your life that you really love, admire, respect, or appreciate? That's step one in the homework. Step two in the homework is beside each of those names, what is there about that person that you love, admire, respect, or appreciate? <coughs> oh, thank you. That just warns me that you better watch out. I'm going to run out of time. Excuse me. <coughs> New. I don't know. All right. 
So what is there about that person? List it next. Now, if, the, if you're very close to this person, it's not just a work friend, but somebody that you're really close to, is there an activity that the two of you share together uh, that, as part of that friendship? Every Thursday morning, myself and four people I began teaching with in 1968 meet for breakfast at Rosie's in South Edmonton. We've done this our whole lives, even though we've gone to different, different career directions and uh, one, one of us passed away just two months ago. But we've done this our whole lives. And so for me, going for breakfast with these uh, four friends is a big part of my life, except this week when I was here in Kananaskis, right? So for me, that would be the activity. Breakfast would be next to the names of these four guys. All right? Now, not everybody on the list will have an activity. It's, sometimes it's just a person that you really respect their teaching style, you, you love the way they work with children, whatever. You know, that's fine. The goal of this assignment, to get you into the whole feeling of what does it feel like to make sure that you're strengthening those, those relationships, is to give yourself a very limited time, no more than a month. Try to keep it within 30 days. Go to everybody on your list and share with them what you, have, what you feel about them. And say, I was thinking about you the other day, and I just want you to know that, what? What did you write? There are three rules to doing this assignment, if you're brave enough to do this. Number one, don't take the list with you. Do not. <laughs> yes, Jennifer, I really appreciate the, no, no. <clears throat> At least memorize it. Well, yes, Jean, uh, yes, uh, yes, I love you. Yes, there we are. Here we go. <laughs> No. Memorize. Number two, under no circumstances, tell them it was an assignment left over from the conference. <laughs> oh, I went to the conference and I'm supposed to tell you that I love you. <laughs> the guy get a workshop and love you. So, no. Just tell them. People in this room will know. If you get up from your table, walk across the room and say, I love you, man, then they're going to know that you're doing your homework. <laughs> These guys already did that. I saw them off on the side here. You know. <laughs> right? But, people here will know, but the people at home will not, right? And number three, number three, when you share this information with this other person, when you do, try to turn it into a phrase that doesn't sound like it's a judgment. Now, for example, you're a great friend is a judgment statement. There's nothing wrong with it. It's an excellent judgment. You're a great friend. It's super. But some people you can't compliment. You ever meet somebody you cannot compliment? You try and you try, and they always give themselves an insult to balance out the compliment. Oh, that really looks good on you. Oh, this thing, man, I, I hate it. I don't know why I wore it. It's just, you know, oh, God, you know. Our, son, our older son is a professional chef. He's co-chair of the culinary arts program at Nate. And we go to his house for Christmas dinner. There's no question. We're going to his house for Christmas. He's Swiss trained. He worked for the hotel chain, McDonald Hotel, and then he went, got an ed, ed degree when he's older, in his late 20s. But he's a wonderful chef. He can debone a turkey in like 37 seconds. <laughs> you know, amazing. But if we said to Jeff, boy, that was really excellent, a really, a really uh, that was a good turkey or whatever, he would almost invariably say, do you think it would maybe a little too much salt? So maybe a little less salt would have been, you know those kind of people? My wife's a quilter. She made me a quilt made out of the fronts of t-shirts of all the schools I visited across Canada over the years. She took all the crests off them, because I can't wear that many t-shirts. And so she made me this two meter by two meter quilt that hung in my counselor office. And it was a great discussion starter for kids coming in to relax and go, wow, that's cool, man. Where are all these shirts from? That's from Ontario, that's from Halifax, that's from Ontario. And it was, really, it was nice. But because she's a quilter and very good at it, those of you who have a quilter or a craft person in your life, don't try to compliment them on the finished product. <laughs> See, Yvonne, no. you don't. Because if I said to Jean when she gave me that quilt as a surprise, what a great job you've done on this quilt, she would have done what quilters everywhere do. She would have gone, well, look, if you get down like this and you look up, <laughs> see that thread up there? It's a centimeter. Oh, man. You know? I reminded her that the greatest quilters in the world are the Amish. And they make a mistake on every quilt on purpose. Because nobody but God is perfect, so why would you attempt to make the perfect quilt? Be humble. I also didn't say to Jean, though, wow, are you ever Amish? Look at the mistakes on this. <laughs> woo, woo. Man, man. The Amish should be proud of you. <laughs> what I said was, I'm going to hang that up in my office. And then she panicked. Oh, you can't let people see it. What? <clears throat> They're going to be seeing it. 
but to be far as saying it's wonderful, it's the greatest quilt in the history of quilts, <laughs> I know. We've been married 47 years. I know what to say, what not to say. <laughs> Situation, <laughs> right? So when you do this assignment, when you do this assignment, try to turn around. Instead of that you're, the great, you're a great friend, to simply say, I'm really glad that you're my friend. I'm so happy that you're a friend of my life. Because what are they going to say then? No, you're not. <laughs> How are they going to turn that down? I love the way that looks on you. No, you don't. Well, yeah, I do. I just told you I do. You know, I really enjoyed that turkey. You did? You know, they can't turn down the compliment if you turn it how you feel. Right? And my last little story, because the laughter, I just tried to build into the presentation. I think you understand the importance of laughter, right? But the, the last little story I want to share with you, and then uh, our time together is, is up, is this. Practicing what I preach, and I have these kids, I have the students do this assignment as well. We don't mark it, of course. They say they did it, they did it. I, I'm fine with that, right? But I did it myself. I made a list of people that I wanted to tell how I felt. And that sort of strengthened out my heart attack. I shouldn't be telling people how I feel at the time, you know, just in case. And so I made this list. And the last one on the list, I kept adding extra people to stall, was my father. <clears throat> my dad and I had this kind of relationship. Hello, son. Hello, dad. So we didn't get along much for most of my life. And I wrote down, on the, uh, made him one of my circles, and I put my dad's name. No activities that we share together. That wasn't going to happen. But I wrote down, I love you. Just that sentence. And Jean looked at it, and she's from a family, you know, these really annoying families. They say they love each other all the time. You know? they, they're hug people. How many here are hug? How many people here are hug people? Go. Oh, man. <laughs> Question number two How many of you are afraid of these people? <laughs> <laughs> Those people don't even put up their hand. I'm not putting up my hand, man. <laughs> they're going to come and hug me if I tell them. All the hug people are back by the door. Quick, make an exit. <laughs> hug people are coming at you. Get out, run. <laughs> hug people always marry non-hug people. It's like a cult. <laughs> I came from a non-hug family. A show of affection in my family is a punch in the arm. <laughs> How's it going, son? Boom, fine, dad, bam. My wife and her family, oh, her mother's been with us since Christmas and she's 93 and she's a hugger, my wife's a hugger. But they hug all the time. Oh, I'm back from the bathroom. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <clears throat> I may be exaggerating. <laughs> Only this much. So my wife, who phones her mom every day, we have a plan where we don't pay long distance, the cable plan. She phones her twice a day. Hey, hi, mom, I love you. I love you, too. <laughs> and, uh, so my, for the last month, you can imagine what my life has been like. I got two huggers, I'm surrounded by them. I love you. Well, man, so she looks at this and says, you're going to tell your dad you love him? Have you ever told your dad that you love him? She said, I don't think so. I can't recall a time. So he's 80 at the time. He's since passed away at age 89. But at the time he was 80, and she said, I can't believe you're going to do that. I said, I tell my students to do this. I've got to do it. I, you know, come on. So anyway, I talked to everybody else, the garbage collectors, the letter carrier, <laughs> everybody. I, I'm making this list. Oh, good, I teach 120 kids this year. That'll take me some time. I'll go there 120 kids. So finally, she said, when are you going to call your dad? Call your dad. He's 80. I said, okay. And I phoned my father. And the phone rang and rang and rang and rang because he's deaf. He couldn't, wouldn't wear his hearing aids. And he must have seen it vibrating because he picks it up and he says, hello? Uh, hi, dad, it's Bill. Who? Bill. Who? Bill. It's Bill. It's your, dad. It's your son. Oh, Bill, how are you? What? Fine. What? <laughs> What's your weather like up there? Because you're in Lethbridge. Edmonton's up. Oh, it's cold up here. Oh, getting the schnook. Getting the schnook down here. What's your crops like? He said, what are your crops like this year? I don't know. <laughs> I'm a high school counselor. I have no crops. We have the Shell Scottford Dow chemical plants in Fort Saskatchewan. Killed all the crops. We got no crops here. He's a, he's a retired letter carrier. He's got no crops either. Why are we talking about crops? <laughs> crops? My wife held up a sign. Dad, comma, I love you. <laughs> oh, so, okay, 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 okay. Hey, Dad, listen, listen. I just wanted to tell you. I just wanted to tell you something. I just wanted to tell you that I, I love you. Well, 
What? Uh, <clears throat> I love you. Speak up, son. Trouble on the phone. I, I can't hear you. Oh. All right. Dad, I love you. I'm yelling the phone. And the phone goes silent. I think I killed him. I killed him. <laughs> He rolled a grain truck during the Depression. He attacked the beaches of France in World War II. He's on his third wife. I killed him. <laughs> oh, my God. But luckily, I was wrong. He was still alive. And he said, uh, do you say uh, you love me? <laughs> yes, I did. Here's his next line. Are you sick or something? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dad, I'm terminal. I got the second. Oh, man, no, Dad, no, I just want to phone and tell you. And then on the other end, it sounds like a car that won't start. My dad has to respond now. He's like, well, son, I... I love you, too. Okay, bye. <laughs> Next time we went to Lethbridge, we almost hugged. It was so close. <laughs> we will never speak of this again. So my point is, <laughs> do the homework, do the homework. And people will say to you, are you sick or something? But that'll be fine, it'll be just fine, because you'll know, after you've done your list, you'll check it off, say, I didn't miss anybody. And it becomes a habit. It becomes a habit. You start to say, the minute you feel something, you say, I'm gonna tell them now. Why would I wait till next week? This is how I'm feeling now, I'll tell them now, right? Balance is so important to those of us who choose to care for others. And my, my message always in doing this is, you can't forget yourself in this process. Nobody outside these professions that you represent believes that this is a stressful life. They don't. We got holidays out there, yin yang man, you get off work at 2.14, and yeah, they say these kind of things, but we know. When you deal with people day in, day out, every day, it's, it's stressful. So take care of yourselves. We'd like to see you back at the conference next year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you for reminding us to, to give ourselves the gift of living, learning, laughing, and loving. We will have a fulfilled lifestyle with all these gifts to ourselves, and we really appreciate your time. On behalf of Avery Active Schools, I'd like to present you with a little gift. Oh, thank you. Thank you.